Good afternoon, South by Southwest. Welcome to music publishing in the new songwriter economy. Please welcome Guy Moot, Murder Beats, Nova Wave, and Hannah Carp. What's up, everybody? Hey, everyone. Hi there. Um, I am thrilled to be here today with some of music's most entrepreneurial songwriters and publishers. Um, we have today the songwriting production duo Nova Wave. We have hey. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Blue June on my right and Chi yes. right after her. Um, we have Murda Beats, who is, um, has production credits on more than 20 number one albums on the Billboard 200. And um, we have Guy Moot, their publisher, the co-chair and CEO of Warner Chapel Publishing. Um, if you have questions, um, please go to the app and pull up the session and uh, click on Engage, and we'll take questions about half an hour into this. Um, and today, um, these amazing people have promised to share their secrets to making money and finding success in what Guy likes to call the new songwriter economy. And no, the secret is not getting ChatGPT or some other AI bot to write your songs for you. Um, but before we spill their valuable secrets, I wanted to ask you, Guy, as someone who's been in this business for more than 30 years and who's signed songwriters like Amy Winehouse and Mark Ronson and Lana Del Rey, can you explain what you mean when you talk about the new songwriter economy? Yeah, I think it's a phrase I've somewhat coined, but I think it, it really describes this rapidly changing uh, environment we're in for songwriting, songwriters and publishers, and, and really the need to embrace that. Um, the song is the very essence, it's the very beginning of everything that we do in this music industry, and hits and great songs are what are most important. That is never gonna change. But I think when we look how we're going to monetize those songs, get those songs heard, get those songs listened to, that's a whole changing gambit. And I think uh, at Warner Chapel, we're, we're absolutely look, we're looking internationally. We can see the way that markets are developing. We have to coordinate. As, as a songwriter, I don't think you can just come to LA and hope to get in the room with every big artist. Some do, some don't. Um, but there's so many other ways to monetize your songs around the world. And of course, so many emerging platforms, potentially AI in future, but uh, whether it's gaming, whether it's uh, uh, the traditional syncs, whether it's Web3, NFT, social media, user generated. I just think as a songwriter now, you have to look at this world slightly differently. Apart from just the lens, I'm gonna get again in the room with a big hit writer. You might do, but there's also, for even the hit writers, and I'm surrounded by hit writers here, I'm honored, but there's also other ways they may monetize their songs. And, and why do you have to look for all these new ways to monetize your music? What are the challenges that you guys are facing as songwriters and, and producers? We gotta get all the money. <laughs> So like you got to make sure you're getting your neighboring rights, your publishing, your SOCAN, BMI, ASCAP, advances, the right splits on the records. There's so many ways to make money off the music. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just like you said, AI is on everybody's tail right now. And so, um, you know, just sticking with that humanistic point of view of the things that we can do um, and what we really bring to the table, I think that is super, super duper important for us to continue that um she you you two signed with warner chapel before guy took over in 2019 what were you looking for um from a publisher and how is guy delivering on what <laughs> guy's killing it <laughs> guy's killing it he took over for big john i remember when we flew to la we sat down with big john and we were like we are not looking for a publisher we're looking for partnership absolutely literally that was the thing that we that came out of our mouths and so warner um even ryan press everyone the creative team over at warner has really 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 
helped us in a lot of ways, like bringing opportunities, like bringing a Lexus commercial yeah. our way and um, a Bose opportunity that just came up. And so Warner has been doing an amazing job of just like yeah, yeah. making sure that we're well taken care of. Yeah, they really, really see the brand outside of music. Music is a vehicle, but our brand is so much bigger. So and they've really in t- taken us in and just like helped us soar. So that's what you're, you need from the publisher is bringing you opportunities. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And, and yeah. can you talk about what the most interesting opportunities have been? Like, what did you do for Bose? And can you talk about some of that? Well, Bose well, is kind of still in... Um, it's still in the works. We yeah. actually shouldn't be talking about that. Um, <laughs> but, I mean... Sorry, to, we didn't say that. <laughs> yeah, that's... Take that out. Um, but to literally... We, we were in a commercial, in a Lexus commercial, like acting, like, you know... DJing in the Lexus commercial, making a song for the commercial. So um, shout out, Crystal. Thank you so much for that. (laughs) We appreciate you. Um, But yeah, uh, I don't know. I mean, I just, the the ways that this publishing company in particular has helped us, um, you need to look for a partnership when you're looking for a publisher. Mm -hmm. And and you guys are all DJing. You're DJing, Murder, you DJ, you know, he killed it last night. I don't know if y'all was at the show. Thank you. You killed it. And you're also making all these other kind of splashy moves that songwriters and producers traditionally haven't made when they've been they've stayed more behind the scenes. But Murda, you launched a limited edition Baby Murda toy, um, and you're the founding investor of Psychedelic Water, which I hope you will be distributing soon at this panel for us to try. Yeah, I just feel like. As creators in music industry, you know what I'm saying? We got to di- diversify just like an entrepreneur, right? So you don't want all your eggs in one basket ever, you know? You want to diversify into everything. So how do you find time to actually make music? I don't know. I just do. <laughs> <laughs> but do you, do you think that you, do you feel a need to be building your own profiles and brands as more sort of public facing brands than yeah i feel like that's a big role you know what i'm saying like branding yourself and just building something that's very sustainable and how does that help your songwriting careers i feel like it just creates longevity you know so you're not just like known for like a hit you're known for like a brand you know mm-hmm. and chi and, and blue i mean how do you balance that need to grow your brand you know you guys just started a clothing line um while still you're collaborating with mega stars with you know big egos and you know a lot of privacy around them how how do you kind of balance those things uh you know the biggest thing of what people know about noble wave is that our number one rule is to be of service so whether we just started this clothing brand it's called heirs in christ um or whether we're working with Beyonce, we're always of service to the moment, always of service to the creativity, always in, of service to God. So honestly, it's not hard for us. Like we've kind of turned our lives into like working really hard to like a vacation. Like, so we work, you know, we may work from home, but it's a party. It's a party <laughs> and you know. I'm never invited. Oh, <laughs> we are de- we're definitely getting in when we get back, for sure, mm-hmm. for sure. But um. Yeah, I mean, honestly, like, we just, we are who we are, Mm -hmm. and it works out. It works for us. Mm -hmm. Let's talk more about the money, where the money is today and where it's going to be tomorrow. Um, You know, there are more than 100,000 songs being uploaded onto streaming services every day, and those are all competing with yours for attention. Um, But fortunately, there are also more and more people that are starting to stream music around the world. Guy, what do you think are the biggest opportunities overseas, and and how can American songwriters and artists kind of engage in those markets or take advantage of um, international growth? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of music, and there's more music coming. I think 100,000 a day is most probably conservative now when you look at some of the other platforms out there. So I think a big part of our job is just getting our songs noticed and getting our songs, creating moments that people are going to find those songs. So I think we're also part of the promotion uh, process. I think internationally it's really important for American writers to, to kind of travel 
and us as publishers to also educate our writers, hey, look at the opportunities. You know, a number one album in France sells X amount. If you've got a big streaming hit in Germany, it's significant. So I think there's a lack of misunderstanding. You know, there's some misunderstanding and education needs doing about the other, the other markets and the potential there. They're big markets. These people are really open uh, to collaborate. Um, sort of in the real sort of hands-on stuff, we arrange a number of writing camps and we take people everywhere. Um, and it's not always just Warner Chapel people. We try and keep it, keep it open. I mean, we recently, a fun one, we took uh, some of our Nashville writers to a uh, town in Brazil called Guyana because I discovered there was a, a form of music there called Santa Negia, which is kind of country with a few more sparkly bits. And um, we had the most incredible writing camp there. I mean, we got some great footage. You know, that's education. I was educated. I didn't know that the dominant music in Brazil, you think it might be, uh, you know, barley funk or some other. It's actually kind of like very close to country music. Uh, we just also did a Latin camp actually in Nashville reciprocally. We did one in Korea. So I think it's just broadening those horizons. These people in other countries are like really keen to collaborate. Mm -hmm. So, Murda, have you... Um, had any international experiences that have helped you grow your brand? Yeah, for sure. Like, I feel like just traveling and just experiencing different cultures helps with anything you do in life, you know? You never want to get stagnant. You want to go out there and experience new things and stuff. And even with, like, the Latin market popping and stuff, you know, I got the chance to work with a lot of those artists as well and just, like, create music from all genres, you know? Like, I never want to be put in a box and be looked at as a trap producer because I see myself as a super producer. Um, out of all the new platforms and income channels there are out there for songwriters, from gaming and Web3 to film and commercials and TV, which would you each say offers the richest returns? Like, what's the most lucrative way for songwriters to spend their time today? Oh, I got to go with film. Um, Sometimes, like writing those film songs, you may come back, they may give you a $300,000, $400,000 check from writing a song for film. It's incredible. Um, so that's gonna be, we, it, honestly, we make a lot of time for film and TV because the way that the money comes out like immediately is insane. Hmm. Um, so Web3 as well. Um, and we're getting into those things, but I have to go with film. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like focus on working with artists, you know what I'm saying? A lot of the, the movies, they want stuff that you got, so it's like stuff sitting around, they'll take it. And like when you release records, like you'll have like like commercials with like um, American Express will like take a song for like half a million dollars and stuff. Like we did that like 2019. Wow. I would kind of say embrace all of it. I know that's not like the accurate answer, but I think you also have to look through the lens. We talked about how much music is being released there. And how these are, we don't just look, you know, want to chapel the value of what's the sync fee? How much is the money? It's like, how many eyeballs, how many years are going to be across that music? Because I think for um, a teenage generation now, they're more likely to discover music on a Netflix show or on a social media platform. So I think you have to look at it all. And so I'm not trying to take the higher ground, but value is in dollars, of course, or whatever currency, but it's also in the awareness and getting noticed out there as well. So we don't turn anything down just because it's cheap. Immediately we go like, hey, what's what's the, the, the knock-on effect of streaming? Everything else that it can drive, you know? Yeah, like even video games too. Like I've learned about so much music through video games growing up, you know? Right. And in terms of genre, um, are there opportunities that you see in certain genres now for songwriters and like I guess where which are the most competitive and where is there more opportunity I mean I think it, everybody's kind of genre agnostic these days mm -hmm. which is a great thing in a way it wasn't like you know when I was growing up like you got to be that or you got to be this um, so I think oh, there's obvious you know I think LATAM I'm telling you, people really that there is an appetite to collaborate an appetite that like different musical formats that make up that music it's not just reggaeton People want to work with electronic. Uh, they want to work with rock. So I think there's opportunities there. I think Asia, I think China now, maybe it's opening up. I think, you know, there's a huge production of C-pop after the K-pop. 
Uh, K-pop's obvious. We encourage our writers to go there because it, it is a fertile p place to go and co-write. I think, going back to what I said initially, I think where it's most competitive is, hey, I say sometimes to our writers, why does everybody want to come to LA and try and get in that one room? You know, there's other places. There's Miami, there's Nashville, there's Amsterdam, there's London, Stockholm, I could go on. So I think the most competitive place is trying to come to LA and make it sometimes. So. Yeah, and like you could focus on Asia for like six months and like literally take over a whole continent and get your music out there too. And then with that and the credentials out there, you could come back, bring that back to North America, and then you could probably have a lot easier ways of getting in like the rooms out here. Yeah, I feel like we've made a lot of ground, murder as well as ourselves, of like being the genre. We are the genre. When you look at our discography as Nova Wave, we have... We're all over the place. And so what we say is, we, if we stick to being Nova Wave on, in any genre, it's going to hit. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, and in terms of the different types of songwriting jobs that, that you guys do, forgetting about the money, which, which are the most fulfilling and which are the most soul-crushing? <laughs> oh, no one's answering that one. <laughs> Definitely still being a real publisher. I still get a kick out of pitching a song. I still get a, a kick out of uh, you know hearing one of our songs on the playlist, the radio. I, I still, that's what I, I get a kick out of, you know? I mean, artist development, most definitely, although we live in a very immediate world of discovery, artist development, whether it's in an A&R context or with, amongst these songwriters, never more important, in my opinion. People develop, get discovered so quickly that you know they they need that support they need a and r wherever it comes from in the broader sense yeah um i joked about ai earlier but it's no joke it's here yeah. it's all anyone can talk about um what how do you guys see ai do you does it frighten you does it excite you it's a little scary uh-huh it is a little scary but i do think if we utilize it in the correct ways um, because it's here, it's here to stay, it's growing like a wildfire. And so um, we've even been coming up with some ideas of how we can really use AI to our advantage as well. Can and you so, talk about those? Yeah, well, I don't want to have to make everybody sign a non-disclosure. <laughs> um, but yeah, like even maybe even approaching AI on the songwriting side as far as uh, say making an app that or a plug-in that will people that don't have a crazy voice like as a demo singer like the difference between her and I her voice is like I, I call her the voice of God right and so we had an idea one time to make a, a plug-in with her voice and then you could just type in the words and then literally that started happening with um, the AI technology that's going on right now so um, we just got to focus on how can we integrate and be better with what's out. And we, you know, you'll never know what you come up with after that. Murdo, mm -hmm. what do you think about AI? It scares the shit out of me. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But at the end of the day, it's just like we are tastemakers. You know what I'm saying? They want you for your taste. So never forget that. You know, a computer can't express the feeling that they got when they're writing songs when we're putting in music, you know? So just never forget that you're the taste. And Guy, as somebody who's running one of the three biggest publishing companies in the world, how do you prepare for a world where AI is so prevalent? I, I think just embrace it. I think, you know, in my time in the music industry, I've seen so many people like try and sue it, shut it down, you know, Napster, close it. So I think this is really one of the most exciting developments in, in technology that we're of ever going to see, I'll see in my lifetime. And... Um, I think, look, everybody thinks in the music industry it's going to eat your lunch. I, I don't think it will. I think it can actually augment creation. It can empower people who haven't created before maybe to create. They might be hobbyists, but that's great. That's, that's recreational. Um, I think if you're making average music to sell, it might be a threat, but I don't know too many people who get up in the morning trying to make average music, but that's where it's going to hit. I think we can really hit have a tiered system here. And of course, we're going to engage with these companies. I think the, the ones who are out there, I can't say too much, want to engage. I mean, we all know um, they've got to put our songwriters' songs and other people's songs into 
the programming and people acknowledge that. So again, I think I think it can be a positive thing. Um, bit like what Murder said, I think, you know, look, I think in some ways it could push the top tier higher. Mm -hmm. It will it will raise the bar. And I'm also a big believer in human imperfection because the bottom line is I don't think you can. Some of the best recordings, some of the best songs are written in the moment. And it is about the moment and it is about the emotion and it is about why the voice wasn't quite right or that drum track wasn't trice, it quite sync. So I'm a big believer in that. So I don't think it's scary. I think if we all embrace it, um, it can be a good thing. And figuring out ways to monetize that. I don't know if people have heard of the website called Splice. We both have packs on Splice. Please go download our packs, Murder Beats. Crazy pack on Splice. Um, Noble Wave Girls Do It Better is on Splice as well. But my point to that is that is somewhat in the AI world because you're taking loops and you're kind of just placing it in. And some of those people make fifty, sixty thousand dollars a month. You can. There's other ways to be songwriters and producers, um, even though what we do is very exciting. But there's other ways to really, really like monetize music and, and make it a lifestyle. So you can make fifty, sixty thousand dollars a month selling your sounds on Splice. Yes, yes. Pl I know a guy that builds plugins. He makes a hundred thousand dollars a month, wow. independently. So um, yeah, there's other ways to to get that bread. Mm -hmm. <laughs> get that bag. Um, what is the hardest? job that you've ever done in the new songwriter economy? The biggest challenge that you took on? Uh, well, we just came off of co-writing and co-producing eight songs on Renaissance, Be uh, Beyonce's Renaissance album. So that was, that was pretty Different. tough. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's not, yeah. she's not, a, not an easy sell. So, um, can't say too much about it, but yeah, uh, <laughs> go on. Probably be <laughs> probably one of the, of the most. Also, some of the stuff in like film, and it's very specific. You know, it's very like for the moment. It's not like oh, you just send a song and they love it and they want to place it. So it's just like you know, making sure that everything that feeling matches like the scene. So that's really difficult, but it's it's fulfilling too once you nail it. So yeah. Yeah, and also us just being women, sometimes the door is, somebody has their hand on the door, like, don't come in. Um, so I specifically remember one time we were working on a movie, a, f a song for a movie, and the film was about a female producer. We produced and wrote a record, and then they didn't want to give us production credit. And it was like, what are we talking, this is your movie. Ah, what are we talking about? what the movie is about. What are you talking about? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, those things are still challenging for us, but we're, we're knocking down doors, mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Murder, what about you? What's, yeah, round of applause for that. Um, definitely when you're trying to work with an artist and they're trying to express a certain feeling and you're trying to make the music to express what they're feeling, you know, but that's definitely like the most fun part of my job. Mm -hmm. um, okay, we're going to take some questions. Um, I, not I, but I'm reading the question. I am a copywriter in advertising, trying to evolve into a songwriter. What are the three mistakes to avoid as I start to navigate the music industry? Get a lawyer. <laughs> Good one. I think reach out to other songwriters, evolve your art, try and learn from other people. Um, it's kind of tough, but easier. You know, you can just, uh, you know, direct a song in, in someone like my direction. I, I still try and listen to everything, but I think it's about, yeah, post your songs, talk about it, um, build a profile out there, learn from other songwriters. I, I find out that there's an incredible community amongst songwriters who want to collaborate and want to assist and help that that next generation or that next wave coming through yeah that was big for us as far as finding a partner so our biggest thing is even a god principle that is really huge in christianity but it basically says that when two or more are gathered god will bless it and so the reason that we are so successful in our career is because we have each other we're stars on our own. We actually named ourselves after the universe. We're stars on our own. But when we come together, it's something different. So definitely find other people to work with. Mm -hmm. And we're always looking for dope people. Like, we want to sign writers and producers. Where y'all at? You know, send us the music. So, yeah, we're, we're, the, you can, we're you looking. You have a lot of people rushing you after this. <laughs> um, 
As an artist and writer, what lengths did you have to go to to finally get that first placement um, and that first amount of real money from your goals? Man, I had to like travel to Chicago by myself, um, chill around trying to find Chief Keith, get songs with him, uh, be on Twitter, go to Atlanta, find the Migos, and then just like put in like years of grind until I first got like my first twenty thousand dollar check from SoCan. <laughs> so, you know, it definitely takes a lot of work, you know, and um, don't start making music just because you want some money. Like, just make music and give people free beats, give people free songs. Like, don't worry about the splits on this. Like, just get your music out there and start to build your brand from day one. Like, don't wait at all. Yeah, and I think also having to endure hearing no a lot. Like, that is the the biggest thing of, like, how bad do you want this? How bad do you want to keep going? So hearing no. If you could get through 10 years of no, you'll have a big yes after 10 <laughs> years. And I know at the same time, it's like, <clears throat> it is a dream for a lot of people to be in the music industry, but you also have to treat it as a business too, you know? People want like, like-minded like people and they want to see the entrepreneur in you and stuff, so yeah. Um, do you all have advice for songwriters with large bodies of work that are ready to get their foot in the door at a publishing company? Um, it really depends if that large body of work is earning. It's not about how many songs you have. Sometimes it's about the, the quality. I actually, as a publisher, find it harder to sell a lot of stuff. You know, if you're in with an artist or a manager or an A&R person going, yeah, this person's got hundreds of songs or they can do rock, they can do everything, they can do R&B. Unfortunately, we're in a world where you've got to distill something and then evolve. I think our job is as, as publisher, once you get in the... the a, a, you know, uh, um, a reputation for something is to keep evolving that. No, you don't just do that. You can also do this. But to just present a huge body of work now is tough. I'd rather listen. Let's be honest. I think any of us on this panel would rather listen, be presented with five or six songs that really meant something and take you on a journey, you know? Yeah, like wait till you have like a few hits and then go sign, you know? Nothing wrong with writing lots of songs because it is an art form you get better and better at as well, you know. Um, but obviously, if it is an earning catalog, yeah, of course, we're yeah. happy to have a conversation. I'm not saying large amounts, but yeah. I remember when I first signed my first publishing deal with Warner Chapel, I had like 250 songs because I was on so many mixtapes. Ryan was like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> um, what songs or projects or albums are you all working on in um, the coming year? We signed NDA, <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> I no, just, just working, just, you know, um, when you do as much work as we do um, and getting in with artists, a lot of the songs you you make, you end up selling. And so it's just like really every year, it's just like re up, getting more songs for our catalogs. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just we're open just to working on it. We're working on everything, basically, yeah. Everything, yeah. yeah, same thing, everything and, like, whatever inspires me, you know? Like, I'm always trying to find new artists, and work with new artists as well, you know? Um, do you believe in making music specifically for sync to be a very competitive market today? I think so, because there's like literally like labels that just focus on that, like APG and stuff, right? Like you get in the room, you have a thousand people trying to make the fast song for Fast and the Furious. So. <laughs> um, I don't really focus on like that stuff too much. I kind of just build with the artist and then if it fits, it fits, you know? Yeah, it's kind of the same for us. It's like it just kind of happens. We just make songs, and then yeah. Most of our biggest sync songs were never written for sync, yeah. and I'm always cautious when someone says, "I'm going to write this. This is perfect for sync." It never gets synced. It's always like you know, we didn't think Lizzo would get this many syncs, you know, and she didn't sit there right. I'm going to write a song about like you know that will fit in a commercial. It just happens, and um, it's bizarre. I could say if you put the word sunshine, that is the most popular like <laughs> word for sync. <laughs> but if you want to write songs about sunshine, know, there'll be too many songs about sunshine. Yeah. But I think there are there are there, it is an art form. I think particularly to picture. I think in film. Um, we shouldn't um, downplay that, but yeah, I think if you're a commercialist going, this is going to get a sync, it might as well be right. Okay. <laughs> Guy, what's your advice for um, publishers that are starting out? 
Um, well, that's quite a broad question. I mean, publishers. I mean, yeah. If you if there's anybody here who wants to become a publisher or start their own publishing company, what, think, what's the I market think, like right now? Yeah, come and come and talk to to me. Come and talk to other publishers. Um, I think you got to learn the basics about the, you know it's important to learn about copyright. It's important to be amongst writers. Um, you know, there's thousands of small publishers out there and they serve an important job as well i mean even if they need to plug into a global infrastructure like ours you know i mean these guys are publishers you know murders i mean there is also i think working closely with writers who mentor other writers and that's akin to a we have lots of our top writers we have jvs with and they're really important and really powerful because they in compliment to us, offer something different. But um, it's quite a broad question, but I'd be, I'd be happy to help. But yeah. Just be guys intern. Yeah, exactly. exactly. We were actually we walking to Berta's show last night, and I asked you a question. I said, you as a leader right now, what would you tell your, and I was asking for myself, because I said, I feel like I'm a leader. So I asked you, I said, what would be your advice um, to yourself as a, as a young leader? And you said to empower the people, to empower the people that work for me, my songwriters and producers. And I felt like that was the greatest advice to make sure that they're taken care of. So I appreciate that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, for produ oh for the producers and Guy. What are your daily routines and how do you stay focused and disciplined? All right, right now, I'll wake up, I'll run a little bit, I'll try to eat clean, I'll play some video games and I'll cook up. <laughs> perfect, <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. Uh, what usually, a day. Yeah, yeah, listen, uh, usually, I like I'll, I'll do something like that. I'll get up. I'll do some jump roping. I will definitely read a little bit of the New Testament most days. And then honestly, I'm finding my highest joy. What is my highest joy at that moment? Is it to sit down and make some music? Is it to watch a movie? Is it to learn something? And so I think if you just follow your highest joy and, and, and do it in, a, in somewhat of a routine and be focused, but at the same time, find, find your highest joy. Yeah, I agree. I just like letting the moment lend itself. It's just like whenever you feel inspired, and I know that's kind of like a, oh, inspired, but, you know, when you've been doing this for as long as we've been doing it, sometimes it's hard to stay inspired, you know, um, finding the things to talk about. Um, so, yeah, it's just like, you know, taking a moment, whatever just feels right, and then, like, you just have that hunger again. Oh, I want to make music, or I want to, you know. But, yeah, so it's just like, you know, um, like I said, we've been doing this for a while, so it's just like, you know, um, making good decisions, keeping good people around you. That's how we stay disciplined. You know, we know where we want to go. We have a vision, so it's just easy. Yeah, Yeah, it's okay to take breaks, too, you know? Like, I feel like when you take a break and come back to it, you're going to be so super strong at what you're doing. Um, back in the day when I was starting out, I was always just trying to pump out beats every day, like 10, 20, 30 beats a day in a session and stuff. But definitely, like growing up with my music and what I've become and stuff, it's like, I feel like a break is like way more useful nowadays. I totally agree with that. I mean, that's true for me, trying to find actually time in my day. I go to the gym, that's where I can listen to music, the weekends, the evenings, because it's tough. Otherwise I get a full schedule, but you're right about creators. I'm also nervous about people saying, I'm going to work harder than anybody else. And I, I work seven days a week and whenever I'm like, yo, where do you live life and write about life and experience life and do all that stuff because songwriting and anything creative even a and r is like you, you're like a sponge you have to take your environment and you travel you get inspired you can't just sit in a room and work harder than than somebody else and uh you know my day it's never it's so different every day that's what makes my job fascinating i mean some days yeah i'm doing a board presentation some days i'm meeting somebody who's a young rapper from the Paris suburbs, you know, other days, and that's what is fascinating about relating to so many different people and trying to understand them. Yeah, like life imitates art and art imitates life. So after this, y'all got to go have some fun, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. I actually have a spiritual advisor, and he told me that um, you break down your hours in a day, eight hours, three sets of eight hours, so eight hours for friends and family. That's your wife, that's your dog, that's Instagram, eight hours for working and eight hours for sleeping. And so I think when I've started to implement that, I have more peace about work, you know, instead of making everything like, oh my God, I gotta write a Pressure. hit song. I got, we gotta get a hit song. And it's like, 
okay, once I evened out my life, those things just came automatically to me. Yeah. Um, here's a good question. The pandemic resulted in critical public discussion um, about the music streaming economy. Do you think the current split between publishing and master rights is fair? So essentially, do, do you feel like... Um, God. That, that might be yeah. coming to me. After. Yeah, I think maybe you should take that first. Of course not. I'm a publisher, but um, we've come a long way. It's improved, and I think um, we continue to improve. So, not exactly, and there's a lot of nuance in that. Where there's uh, all, you know, where there's a visual, where there's a sync component, um, we're we're unashamed about trying to get the best rights for our songwriters. I mean, that that that's what we do, and it's not just about these days. I think the rights; it's how quickly everybody's going to get paid. Uh, because it's inherently slow, so I think we're all working closely and we're all in it together to get better rates, songwriters, publishers, PROs, and get people paid accurately and more fairly. I think rates, yes, but there's a lot of money that goes missing still, particularly in that user-generated journey, and that's where I think we as, as publishers and Warner Chapel we want to really focus in on as well, because there's a lot of money left on the table and it's not good enough. Yeah, we should be getting, like, athlete contracts, you know? Definitely. Um, how, how quickly do you guys get paid? Like, can you give me examples for different types of projects? Sometimes it could be quick, like a couple of weeks, but most of the time it's, like, a year or, like, six months or, like, you know? Take, it definitely takes time. Yeah, we're creating music for the future. So even some one time we had a song that was placed and it was five years old. And so, so you never know. And, like, rappers don't like to sign contracts, so... And the managers don't like to ask them about it. So. Right. And, and there's always going to be a lag, even in the airplay world. That's why I think some of these other things that we talk about in the new songwriter economy is really important. It, it kind of like can it can be quick turn quicker turnover sometimes as well. You know. Um, as creatives, what are the biggest lessons that you've learned about managing your money? You got to learn how to spend money. And you learn how to save it. That's very but, true. But how, how did you learn that? Did, did you have an You got to spend money. I don't know. You got to, like, <laughs> treat yourself. Like, at the end of the day, you know, you never know when your last day is going to be. So we make it, you make it, if you're fortunate enough to make money off this shit stuff, I don't know if I can swear, but spend that shit, too. <laughs> treat yourself, like, you know, and then also, like, find things to invest in that you're passionate about. If you want to get into real estate, go find a portfolio, go do your thing, you know? We've learned to pay your taxes. Pay them taxes. I was pay just about to say that. Taxes. Pay them taxes. Okay. Pay them. Take it out. Just and put it in the account. That's that's literally all I have to that's say. That's it. <laughs> no, get a, get a business manager. You know, get an accountant. Whatever you think you need, they're different. Um, but absolutely, pay your taxes. Yeah, definitely get like a business manager. You know what I'm saying? So you don't gotta think about that stuff. Like when you make money, they put away the tax reserve and mm -hmm. put away some for investing and stuff. You'll be straight. Uh. Murda, can you tell the story of when you first met the Migos? So I was like 17. They flew me to Atlanta. Um, Coach and P, they didn't know if I was making my beats. They're like, who's this white kid from Canada? Like, we don't know. So they flew me down to Atlanta, and I got in the studio with them. Um, Offset was locked up at the time, so it was like taking Quay. And, um, yeah, I was just like a young, shy kid, like just wanted to be around and just wanted to figure it out, you know? taking the risks that I wanted to take. And uh, I was just in the studio cooking up. At the time, they were living in the studio in Atlanta, so we, I was just, like, staying with them in the studio. We're cooking up, made a lot of songs. Some of the songs didn't come out. One of them was Emmett Smith. That was, like, my first one that was, like, on BET and stuff. And then from there, just started, like, living with them, and you know what I'm saying? R.P. my brother take off, so, yeah. yeah. Um, have you ever felt imposter syndrome early in your careers, and do you still feel it ever? And if you have, how do you overcome it? All the time. And, and how do you grapple with that? I talk to my friends. <laughs> Good advice. Um, believe it or not, I mean, I wasn't universe. I didn't go to great schools. Um, I left school very early. Um, so I had to learn the business from the ground up. But I still find in certain rooms, I'm like, I haven't got an MBA, and I didn't finish some of my maths coursework. And, um, but, you know, you learn different things in life, you know, and you learn it from the ground up. And um, I think as a creative, a lot of people 
um, said to me when I was younger that, you know, creative people couldn't be entrepreneurial or business people. There was always this joke about how many A&R people does it take to change a light bulb, you know. I won't give you the punchline, but it wasn't very uh, complimentary. But yeah, I think creative people can, and that it's the music business. You've got to marry the two things together. So. Okay, I have to hear the punchline now. <laughs> I can't, it wasn't good. It was very... Yeah. <laughs> It was more than three, you know what I mean? Okay, it was like one to hold the ladder, one, and it's just, yeah. <laughs> right. um, what do you think about AI artists and um, the place of AI in music creation and consumption? I mean, we talked about that a little, but, but when, you know, we have these artists that are sort of purely AI. Well, everybody took a deep breath. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you could get crucified either way you go with this. But anyway, um, I think I, I like it. Now, I will say we've been approached before in 2000, I don't know, 14, um, for her to be the voice behind an AI oh, one wow. time. Um, a long time ago, it didn't work out, but uh, we were in the middle of creating it. And so... Um, actually, creating for the AI uh, was Monica's commitment um, that was our first number one record. So I'm not mad. <laughs> um, I'm going to just stop there. I'm going to stop there. Mm -hmm. okay. it's, it's a tough one. I mean, I think you've got to see it. I think you've got to have an open mind to see it. I think there's some talk about... You know, whether it's even the holograms and stuff like that, is it is it morally correct to bring people back from the dead kind of thing, but there again, I would have loved to see Bob Marley life. You know what I mean? But I think I don't think you can replace that emotive connection um, until somebody shows me otherwise. It's not just it's what's what an artist says between a song or how they empathise with the crowd. I don't know that AI will ever be able to create that, but let's see. Let's let's you know, it might be great. I don't know. I think it's kind of whack, honestly. <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's kind of whack. I don't know. But I might feel differently a year from now. I might yeah. be like, oh, I love the idea, but right now, I just it doesn't make sense for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did your formal musical training um, help your current careers, if you had any? Can you talk about that? Well, I'm a producer, so I started playing drums like super young, and definitely that kind of yeah, like I like have hard beats and stuff. So, do you think that's important for people who are trying to become songwriters and producers today to sort of seek classical training? I don't think so. Like you know, like I feel like even like the way I started making beats, I didn't know how to play piano, and I started making all my beats off the piano. So I just like learned some scales play by ear like even the way I taught myself drums like I would just like put on headphones and just play along the songs so I definitely don't think you need to go to school and like spend that money you know like even like when I was first coming up like I did I couldn't pay ten thousand dollars a year to go to a music school so I just figured out how to do it without it yeah and funny thing for me I didn't grow up listening to music at all like I didn't have cable I lived on a farm uh it's I lived on dirt roads and so Somehow I still ended up in this position today. And so I'm thankful. Um, I, did, I did do band. I did do band a little bit. But you don't have to. It's, it, music is within you. You're just discovering life. You're discovering the music. But it's already there. Mm -hmm. It definitely helps, though. Yeah. It, definitely it helps. helps. It helps. Like, I wish I did. Like, I wish I was, like, learning piano for the last five years. Like, I still haven't took a lesson. So it's like, that definitely helps mm -hmm. and, like, expands the way you create music, you know? I think it's how you're taught. I think if it's too conformist, you know, I'm almost like you can really change somebody's voice if somebody tells you you just sing that way. Sometimes, the, again, that natural emotion, uh, those mistakes are what make a voice so special. And I'm sure you could go back over the years and there's many vocalists who had no real vocal training. You know, yeah, like, some of the best. Like when you work with like rappers and stuff, like they're not like classically trained, so they know how to sing in a couple keys on auto tune. Then you go work with like Ariana Grande, and I'm like, so like, how do you like to sing? She's like, oh, I can sing in any key. <laughs> um, what do you think about live instruments coming back into commercial music? And are you excited? I think it needs to happen immediately. Immediately, immediately. Um, 
again, we're looking to sign people, guitarists, uh, drummers, whoever. But it's so important because it brings a different type of emotion. Um, and like you were saying, not even just even not having things on the grid all the time is going to invoke certain things inside of you. Um, your heart doesn't beat at the same tempo all the time. So from within to, to the outer, like we definitely need some natural like things. You know what I mean? We need to put that back. And, you know, I, I matter of fact, I, I saw this video one time and it said by 2070, the music was just going to sound like and I was like, oh, my God, the way that it's moving. So I definitely think it's important. <laughs> I definitely feel like that was like a challenge, like making trap music and stuff, because a lot of people mm -hmm. didn't think it was real music at first. And you don't see a band like even like if you talk to your parents, they're like well, there's no band. Like, is it like real music? But I feel like we definitely expressed and like proved to the world that like all music is real music because mm -hmm. we made it like the biggest genre in the world, you know. But coming from like a rock background and stuff, like I have like a deep passion for like live instrumentation and stuff so i feel like that should like never ever leave music yeah. yeah and i think well i'm all for live instruments but not you know i think the bigger challenge is getting people to just go in depth enough i mean to listen more than 10 11 seconds of music and you know i love songs with great arrangements strings horns and I think that's, you know, I'd love to see that come back. But I think the, the real challenge is making sure we get people to listen to a whole album one day <laughs> or go through the whole track. But, and, you know, I'm not being like old, old fashioned about it either. You know what I mean? I, I, you've got to embrace the new. But, yeah, I think part of our job is like, how, how do you get people to really deep dive into something? We were talking about the album last night. I'm like keeping your album short and uh, I was really happy my daughter listened to the Scissor album you know like four or five times but but that's a rarity but it, it can be done you know what are some of the ways that you're trying to get people to listen to a whole album how can you do that as a publisher um first thing I tell them is don't put too many tracks on your album I think some of the best tracks on it. it's got to be a journey it's got to be a piece of work you know when you got 20 Two, twenty-three tracks, and it's not really my job as a publisher to say that, but I firmly believe it. Um, and again, all those other pinpoints, if we can put a context around sync licensing, usages, stuff like that, social media, I, I, I don't think it's people discover music by word of mouth like they used to anymore. You've got to have all the signposts. It's got to be socially, culturally relevant. So all those other things that you build around your music points them, I think, to, to really immerse themselves in you as an artist and in the album. So. Um, what spaces or ways have you seen action and not just talk towards gender equality in the music industry in recent years? Well, we've, we've done some things with Spotify. I really, really appreciate what Spotify has done to somewhat, I guess, rectify certain things that were going on with songwriters and women. And so we were labeled the equals Spotify songwriter ambassadors of this month. And um, just, just them being behind women producers, mm -hmm. we've seen that in recent years, especially from Spotify, for sure. And what, Apple Music as well. What did that mean for you to be named ambassadors? Did that sort of have an impact on your streaming at all or or do you think definitely that uh the billboard in new york is not bad gotta love that okay, um love that. it's such a blessing such a blessing but yeah i mean it it's everything because they're like you said there's over a hundred thousand songs that come out every day and so for them to recognize us and say you guys are really dope or you women are really really dope let's spotlight you um, they know how hard it's been, particularly for women, and so to, to get that support is dope. Yeah. It's just the visibility is everything, because us growing up, we didn't have this to see. So just knowing that other young ladies see, oh, okay, cool, I can do, I can be a producer. And, you know, so just have, helping to break that ground and, and into that fertile soil and just planting new seeds for something else to grow. I think it's just super important. What else do you think streaming platforms could be doing to support um, songwriters and producers that they aren't doing right now? Paying us more. More money. <laughs> more money. Throw us a bag. Where right. It's about money. At least, a, at least a cent. Like. Yeah. <laughs> but aside from giving you the riches you deserve, do you think there's any way they could innovate like to be, to be able to surface your work better when... Uh, yeah, like more, more recognition, more visibility to like songwriters and producers and stuff. And engineers, you know, shout out to if there's any engineers in the building. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, are the Grammys still relevant? And um, there's a feeling that often the should have won artists and songs are not recognized by the voters. Who asked that question? <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's relevant for us because we just got our first trophy. Um, so, <laughs> thank you, God. It's finally on the way. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's relevant for us. Um, I know sometimes there are some disappointments. What can we say? I don't know. I, no. I think it's challenging for, like, the next generation come through. I don't think they're engaging with award shows in general the way that they should do. I don't know. I think I, we had a chat last night, man, and also about the charts. It's just, I think, trying to put those things. I think the whole thing needs reformatting. I'm not being specific about the Grammys. I could be talking about the Brits or anything, but I think they're declining, and I think they need freshening up. Um, or we need to re-engage, or you got to think about the platforms. I mean, hardly anybody turns on the TV anymore, you know. So how do you how do you use different platforms to kind of convey that? So, not really a publishing question, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Murda, do you think the Grammys matter? Um, I think it's definitely still relevant, but I feel like it is losing credibility. You know, like when you know that an artist like blew everybody away for a whole year, and they go up for T like 15, 20 nominations and you walk home with zero, that's kind of crazy. Yeah, agreed. Um, can you speak about lyrics that are being used as evidence in criminal trials and how can art and expression be protected better? Well, I think they should be completely separate, honestly. I mean, we got to go back through every lyric and find something incriminating or it's it's about expression and that expression sometimes is, you know, we all get mad in the moment. Doesn't mean we went and did something or killed somebody or whatever. Did Freddie Mercury's mother really kill somebody? I mean, it's crazy, you know? It's like, I think you have to separate the two things, creative expression vis-a-vis -vis what is used in, in, in court as evidence, you know? Yeah, at the end of the day, it's still the entertainment business, you know, so they gotta figure that shit out. Um, what does the decision-making process look like when you're selecting which and how many songs to put on an album? What does the decision-making process look like? Um, well, it's kind of hard for us to say. I know you've actually put out albums, so maybe that's a better question for you. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, oh, I can. Uh, <laughs> I can. Um, My bad. I feel like it's just like whoever you're working with at the time, it's kind of like a group effort, you know? like. Yeah. Yeah. yeah my, my, my bad. Yeah. That made, my bad. Yeah. Basically, because I was saying, basically, we haven't put out an album, but, we, but again, we kind of like, sort of EP. We've so. EP basically some albums. So usually, when we work on an album, we have five to eight songs, pretty much. So again, it's just feeding the art artist, being of service to the artist, and and just doing our best to convey their message, and then that's how we end up with five and eight songs. Um, so. Yeah, at the end of the day, like, the artist is going to do what they want to do, but we, we can be there to, like, inspire them, and you know what I'm saying? Like, be like, yo, but this song two years ago was hard, too, you know? Because I feel like a lot of artists be forgetting about a lot of the music, too. Yeah, very true. What advice would you give to your younger selves when you were trying to find your sound, and how did that process look like for you in the beginning? Hmm. I think the advice I would give to my younger self is just be true to who you are. I think when I first we first started and then just even demoing songs, we're like, oh, you sound like Esther Dean and oh, you sound like this person. And I thought I had to be that person. So things were just moving really, really slowly. I wasn't getting any, we weren't getting placements. And then one day I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to do what I want to do. Go back to what I do. And then that's when we start to see more success. So just being true to who you are, like that's just really what it is. And, and then allow people to catch on to it. Yeah, for sure. I remember creating the beat for we were, when we created the beat for crazy Kalani and I specifically remember the title being 813 because I'm from the Tampa area and I was like you know what I just got to get back to me and how I feel and what I like and it was like it it worked out a week later and so um, like she said just be authentic to you um do streaming platforms have too much power in terms of their featured playlist curation? And does that block lesser known artists from organically bubbling up, would you say? 
I think that playlisting, you know, the power of playlisting might be moving a little bit personally. Um, I think um, people are discovering music from all over the place. Like I say, I think, you know, it could be a show placement, could be euphoria, could be online, could be a, a lot of it is visual these days. I think, you know, um, I think my kids discover music just by looking at people on Instagram or, and that could be new music or old music. So I, I don't think so. I think, I think I, we were again talking last night. I think that algorithm is dangerous because I was lucky enough to grow up in, in you know, the UK and we had one radio station, but it was told to play everything. So I listened to all the music I didn't like. And I think I was a lot more rounded and richer for it. So sometimes, and some of that music I didn't like back then, I kind of like now. So um, I think the algorithm it can be a little, little dangerous, but I, I think it's shifting away from that now, personally. I definitely think it's crazy. You could just like work at Apple or Spotify and like control an artist's career and how much money they make and stuff. It's definitely like kind of weird. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, last question. Uh, what has been some of your favorite music over the past year, each of you, and what are you all listening to now? Uh, Rosalia's album, um, Montel Fish, and like a bunch of rappers. <laughs> Um, I'm particularly excited we signed Strome, who I think is amazing, uh, French-speaking artist. Um, I love Rema because I've watched his career, and I think Calm Down's just amazing. A um, couple of newer things, we've got Daniel Ponder playing, playing here this afternoon, who I think is amazing, a new girl called Alicia Cretti. But I always have to go back to my, a lot of kind of old Jamaican dub, a lot of rare groove, and I, like, I still like digging in the crates as such. So I have my periods, I call it like an oral laxative, where I have to go back and just clean my my ears out in a way so it it's diverse and then there's stuff that i have listened to for work which isn't always so uh, you know we we have great music but I, I don't know what german rappers are saying you know but yeah <laughs> yeah I've, I've recently been listening to like a lot of the doors too and um mtv unplugged nirvana album i think that's fire too this is gonna sound so crazy, but we actually don't listen to a lot of music. Um, a lot of times we listen to talk radio, we listen to comedy albums, we listen to podcasts. Um, and I actually heard, we, we found some comfort because I heard Missy Elliott say that as well. She's like, I don't listen to music. Hmm. Um, and so I think the, my favorite music right now is just when I'm walking somewhere and I Shazam something, it could be from 60 years ago and I'm like, Wow, this is an incredible song. And so whatever music finds me, that's that's my favorite right now. Absolutely Renaissance. I mean <laughs> well, that too. I mean, like seriously, I just think it was one of the best albums released within the, the past year and yeah, super innovative and creative. So yeah, that's my vibe. Yeah, we did listen yeah. to that one. Yeah. <laughs> it's For the record. really good though. It's yeah. actually yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> Um, aside from jumping rope and reading the New Testament, not listening to music, any any parting advice for um, aspiring songwriters out there today? Yeah, I would just say don't let the fear trap you. Uh, we have a mantra of you don't have to be confident, you just have to be courageous. Be courageous in the moment. So that's every moment of your day. Sometimes, you, I don't know, even like you may have a fight with, your girlfriend or something, pick up the phone and be courageous in the moment and call her, call your mom, like do things in the moment that are going to propel you for the next moment. Yep. I just think just don't, just don't give up and just keep going, you know? Like I feel like the music, like creating music can be like tough sometimes, but you just gotta like fight through and don't listen to people. A lot of people are gonna doubt you along the way. Yes. Principals, teachers, friends, kids at school, wherever you're at, you know what I'm saying? Just Keep grinding, keep going, keep your head down, and, and through consistent through consistency, you'll find success. Yeah. Great. Thank you guys so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone.